That just gets better every year. Good afternoon. My name is Terry Cannon. I am the executive director of the Baseball Reliquary. And on behalf of On behalf of the Board of Directors and membership of the, of the Reliquary, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the 19th Annual Induction Day Ceremony for the Shrine of the Eternals. The bell ringing which has commenced these festivities since 1999 is in tribute to the late, great Hilda Chester, one of the game's most legendary fans and an icon to baseball reliquarians far and near. Hilda sustained the Brooklyn Dodgers with her ever-clanging cowbells, and she stood out even among the many loud eccentrics in the intimate confines of Ebbets Field. I like to begin the ceremony each year with an anecdote or reminiscence about our beloved Hilda. And today I turn to someone who, as a young broadcaster, was well acquainted with Hilda's lung power and unique charm, Vin Scully. Vin was once asked what his favorite ballpark was, and here was his response. Quote, well, you know, in some ways, Ebbets Field was my favorite place. Ebbets Field was intimate. You were very well aware of the fans, individual fans, where in the modern day ballpark, and I don't mean to put them down, but the fans are somewhat like audible wallpaper. You see them, but you're not aware of the individuals. I remember, bless her heart, there was a woman in Brooklyn named Hilda Chester. And anyone old enough to remember Hilda knows exactly what I'm talking about. She carried a big cowbell, believe it or not, and she moved sometimes from the bleachers to the grandstand. The seats were $1.10 general admission. And one quiet afternoon, there must have been about five or 6,000 people in the ballpark, and I was sitting rather primly alongside Red Barber, and he was doing the game. And all of a sudden, I heard this deep, almost basso profundo voice coming out of a woman. And she said, Vin Scully, I love you. <laughs> and the crowd roared, and I got red-faced and dropped my head. And when the crowd roar stopped, she said, Look at me when I'm talking to you. <laughs> and that broke everybody up. So that was Ebbets Field, the individuals as opposed to the large stadium, end quote. And so with the tip of our cap to Vin Scully, we say, Hilda Chester, we love you. And it is our pleasure to talk about you and to remember you each year at these festivities. And now it is time to bring to the stage the flagship musical quartet representing the San Fernando Valley Symphony Orchestra. Known as the Symphomaniacs, the quartet is noted for incorporating class and humor into its performances. And their eclectic repertoire ranges from Baroque, classical, and romantic music to pop and contemporary favorites, or as they like to describe it, everything from Bach to the Beatles. The Simple Maniacs are comprised of Ruth Breuger on violin, James Domine on guitar, Glenn Grab on cello, and Larry Meridian on bass. The Simple Maniacs will perform a rendition of Take Me Out to the Ball Game, arranged by Larry Meridian, which I am confident will be unlike any version you have heard before. But first, we ask the audience to please rise as the Simple Maniacs perform our national anthem.
How about a, a, a round of applause for the bass player, Larry Moradia, who arranged that. Before the keynote address and the induction of our Shrine of the Eternals class of 2017, it is my pleasure to introduce the recipients of two awards presented annually by the Baseball Reliquary. Leading off, we have the Hilda Award, established in 2001 in memory of Hilda Chester, and created to recognize distinguished service to the game by a baseball fan. As you know, we often refer to the Hilda as the Reliquarian's equivalent of the Oscar or the Emmy. It acknowledges our royalty, it symbolizes the best aspects of fandom, and it celebrates the myriad ways in which we exhibit our love affair with the national pastime. We have, I believe, three former Hilda recipients with us this afternoon, and perhaps each of you could stand as I recognize you. It's kind of like a mini reunion of sorts. Emma Amaya, 2013. <laughs> Emma is the Dodgers super fan who has been known on more than one occasion to dress up as Hilda Chester at Chavez Ravine. <laughs> Tom is the mastermind behind the Eddie Goodell Society. He's been successful in spreading the Goodell gospel from Spokane to Dublin. And I believe he has left a pile of literature back there, uh, pins, and uh, are you prepared to sign people up as members today? It's an open enrollment. Everyone's in for free, and the uh, pins and membership cards are in back. There you go. <laughs> and uh, the anniversary of Eddie's uh, at bat, which is coming up on August 19th, will be celebrated in a number of venues around the country, including. Los Angeles, John Leonidikas, who's sitting down here in the front row, is the, is the Los Angeles president of the Eddie Goodell Society, and we're working on details on that. So if you follow the Baseball Reliquary website or Facebook page, you'll, hear, uh, you'll have uh, information on that event. And lastly, Tom Derry, 2016. Tom is the founder of the Naven Field Grounds Crew, who spent six memorable years engaged in a grassroots urban renewal project unlike any other, preserving and maintaining the historic Tiger Stadium playing field in Detroit, and in so doing, allowing thousands of fans to reconnect and spend quality time with an American landmark. Today, Cam Perrin joins the ranks of Hilda recipients, and at age 22 is the youngest recipient to date, born many years after Hilda shuffled off this mortal coil. <laughs> like many of us here today, Cam's initial interest in baseball was kindled through collecting baseball cards and acquiring the autographs of major league players. But 10 years ago, Cam's interest took a change of direction 
which would transform not only his life, but that of many of the ball players who he would come to know personally. At age 12, Cam became, fa became fascinated with the Negro baseball leagues, the leagues that would have their heyday in the years before baseball's integration. At first, he wrote numerous letters to veteran players of the Negro leagues with the sole purpose of obtaining their signatures. But he ended up acquiring much more than autographs. Cam's correspondences with Negro League players quickly grew from handwritten letters to phone calls. By the end of the seventh grade, he was often talking on the phone for two to three hours per day with these players. He became immersed in tracking down former players, players for whom very little information existed or in some cases were not even known to be alive. He began making homemade baseball cards for players who never had them. He also started conducting extensive newspaper archive research to piece together the puzzle of a relatively undocumented aspect of American history. Cam's path eventually led him towards the Negro League Pension Program, a program offered by Major League Baseball which provided pension funds to those who could furnish evidence that they played in the Negro Leagues for four years. By scouring computer databases and newspaper archives, Cam was able to supply the necessary documentation that would allow well over a dozen Negro League players to receive pensions of nearly $10,000 a year, a payout that was often life-changing. By age 15, Cam began attending and eventually helping to organize an annual Negro League baseball player reunion held in Birmingham, Alabama, where he was able to reconnect players, some of whom had been out of touch for 50 years. These reunions provided the players an opportunity to congregate, share stories, and gain recognition for their achievements that were never acknowledged. Last month, Cam attended his eighth consecutive reunion where many of these ball players treat him as if he were their own son. While there have been so many success stories connected to Cam's passion and research, perhaps the words of former Memphis Red Sox player Russell Mosley best convey the meaning and impact of Cam's efforts. Mosley was able to say to his family and friends with pride and conviction, I really did exist. Cam graduated from Tulane University in New Orleans in 2016 with a degree in business management. He currently operates an e-commerce business and works at the William Morris Endeavor Talent Agency in Los Angeles. In his spare time, he's usually at home blindly calling phone numbers that may or may not belong to former Negro League ballplayers. As we unveil the 2017 Hilda Award, please welcome a young man whose dedication to the unsung heroes of the Negro Leagues has earned him our gratitude. Cam Perrin. Thank you, Terry, and thank you all for coming out, and thank you for giving me this award. It's pretty cool. Um, so Terry uh, told you a little bit about my background. I'll tell you a little bit more. There might be a little bit of overlap. But as a young kid, I played every sport um, you could play. Baseball was my favorite. Started playing when I was about seven, eight years old. And in 2004, the Red Sox won the World Series. And that was the biggest, most amazing thing that could have ever happened as a baseball fan, a baseball player, and a kid from the suburbs of Boston. So the first goal of mine was to meet all the guys on the 2004 team. So as a, I don't know, maybe 9, 10, 11 year old kid, whatever I was at the time, um, I decided to go to Johnny Damon's book signing. And I stood outside in the snow for five hours to meet Johnny Damon. <laughs> and 
by the time um, he was there for about two or three hours and we were about 30 people away from meeting him and everyone at the bookstore said that he was going to have to go home. So we started chanting, me and my mom started chanting, saying, Johnny don't go and we, we got the whole line to start. <laughs> And I ended up getting up there and meeting him and talking with him. He signed my book, and uh, that was one of the first interactions I had with a, form, uh, with a baseball player at the time. David Ortiz followed several months later, and a few years later it kind of hit me, well, you know what? I don't really like these new players all that much. They don't really take their time to interact with their fans in the way that I really wanted. So um, come 2007, the Red Sox won the World Series again, and that kind of set me off on a, new, on a new direction. A friend of mine introduced me to writing letters to baseball players through the mail. Um, there was this website called sportscollectors.net where you could get their addresses, and I started writing letters, um, not to the modern players, but the guys like George Kell, Bobby Doerr, Sparky Anderson, guys from the 40s, 50s, and 60s. So I'd send a card, write out a handwritten letter, explaining how I was this 12-year-old baseball fan and player, and I would ask them to sign some cards and a few weeks later I'd often get them back. So I did that for about six, seven, eight months um, at the age of 12 and it wasn't just like a normal um, hobby. I mean I was sending out 20, 30, 40 letters a week. It was, it was an obsession. I would call the post office if the mail didn't come by like five or six o'clock. <laughs> they, they knew me. So within about six or seven months I have like five, six hundred baseball cards signed. And then my direction, then I, I make another turn and Topps, Allen and Ginter comes out with a Negro League baseball card, a, a baseball card set which features several Negro League baseball players. So I write to them and I'm fascinated by them. Rather than having played in the major leagues and getting recognition, um, these guys didn't. These guys were the underdogs and no one had ever really reached out to them or written to them. So when I'd write to them, instead of just signing a, a card and sending it back, they'd write me a two or three page handwritten letter. And that really sucked me in. There was a difference between getting a Sparky Anderson signed baseball card back in the mail and getting a three page letter back in the mail um, talking about their career, asking me about mine and where my interests lied. So I just got carried away. And I started writing to player after player after player and again, you know, dozens and dozens a week. And then I would put my phone number in there. And before I knew it, um, a few of these guys started calling me up on the phone. I started calling them and these relationships kind of built. And I'm, I'm 12 at this time, so, <laughs> so what I would do is I would get all my homework done in school in 7th, 8th grade, and I did this throughout high school, um, never really stopped doing that. So when I got home, I would immediately start writing letters, calling people, and eventually making baseball cards, doing all this other stuff. So I started writing letters, talking to these guys on the phone, and I started to realize several themes. None of these guys had stayed in touch with their former teammates. None of them really had any newspaper articles or photos or anything that really recognized them in any way or tied them to their careers. This was kind of like a lost piece of their past that they didn't really have anything to show for. And then lastly, they had not got any recognition. Um, you know, if you played one game in the major leagues, you can Google the person and find their name on baseball reference, see everything about their background. With these guys, you could have played six years in the Negro League and nobody knows who you are. People, you know, people in your, t in your hometown, your neighbors, don't really even get it. They don't really understand that you are a professional baseball player because there's nothing to show for it. So I took those three themes and I kind of ran with it and did what I thought I could do. The first, I started digging up all these old newspaper articles. Um, there were several websites where I could pay like nine or 15, uh, 10 or $15 a month and get these old newspaper articles. I would search through them and I'd find these articles which showed these guys' names and I'd send them to them and they'd be thrilled. Then I started tracking down their former teammates, which you're probably like, whoa, how, what? So, what I would do is I would quiz them. I'd ask them all sorts of questions. I would say, hey, who is your second baseman? Who is your third baseman? Where was he from? Uh, when was the last time you talked with him? And they'd say, oh, um, Russell Patterson. Russell Patterson was from Patterson, New Jersey. And he's, pr he's probably about my age. You know, I'm, I'm 75 right now. He's probably around the same age. So while I'd be on the phone with this guy, I'd be looking on these websites, looking for a Russell Patterson from Patterson, New Jersey. Well, I found one, and he was now living in South Carolina. So I'd end my call and call this guy up. It was him. And I did that dozens and dozens of times. 
By the time I'm 15 or 16, I found all these guys. When I'm 15 years old, I blindly, or when I'm like 13 or 14, I blindly call up this researcher in Texas named Dr. Ravel, who's like the god in Negro League research. Um, he's been doing this since the 80s, and he has the biggest collection in the world. So I call him up blindly, and we become best friends. We talk on the phone two or three times a day when I'm, when I'm 13 and he's like 65. And, <laughs> We eventually decide we should have a Negro League reunion in Birmingham, Alabama. So here I am, this 13 or 14 year old kid and this 65 year old guy and we're teaming up and we're planning this reunion in Birmingham, Alabama. Well, there's one problem. I'm, I'm in school. I'm in, I'm in high school at, the, at this time. So my mom um, and dad talked, they're like, well, how, is, how are we going to get him off of school for a week to go down to Birmingham, Alabama? So. I'm in school one day, she goes up into my room and grabs one of my binders full of letters, brings it into the principal and shows him and says, hey, look, like, take a look at this. This is history in the making. You gotta let, you gotta let this get off. So I went, I went to the reunion with my mom and I was down there for about a week. And a lot of the players that I had tracked down and been speaking to on the phone for quite some time, I convinced them to come down too. So I met them for the first time. Russell Patterson was one of them. And since then, we've now had about eight or nine reunions and several additional events in Birmingham, Alabama. The first year I went down with my mom, the second year when I was 15, I went down by myself and I roomed with one of the former players. I've been rooming with him every year since. <laughs> and now we have these amazing reunions. We've had hundreds of guys over the last few years that come down. In the meantime, I've tracked down all sorts of baseball players, some guys in their early 70s that were 15 years old when they first started playing in the Negro League, some guys that are 100. And so there's all sorts of different ranges. A lot of these guys you know, were the, the janitor at a high school for their entire career. Some of these guys went and started million dollar corporations. These are people from all walks of life. So yeah, um, so many other stories that I can't think of right now or you can ask me about later. But yeah, so the last 10 years of my life have kind of been this unique kind of hobby slash passion dedicated towards the Negro League. And um, yeah, that's, that's me. And uh, <laughs> one, one more thing, one more thing. So while all this stuff's going on, started out my school newspaper contacted me. They were kind of intrigued. And they said, hey, Cam, uh, can we do an article on you? And then that led to the, the local paper. And then that led to the Boston Globe. And then MLB.com and HBO and all this other stuff. So I've now done two HBO Real Sports with Brian Gumbel segments. And after the first one, a TV writer, a writer for the TV show Bones, reached out to me and said, hey, you know, I'd love to do a feature film on this. So we now have a feature film in the making. I moved out to Los Angeles. He helped me get a job. And uh, just stay tuned. Um, so in the next few years, we might have something big coming. <laughs> Our second award was established in 2002 to recognize individuals for their commitment to the preservation of baseball history. The Tony Salem Memorial Award is named in honor of a great reliquarian, a baseball author, historian, and archivist who passed away in 2001 at the age of 49. Tony is dearly missed by all of those closely involved with the reliquary, and he is fondly remembered for his dedication to the study and research of unsung ballplayers and forgotten aspects of baseball history, which he felt were important to document and keep alive for future generations. And as you can tell, Tony Salen and Cam Perrin are definitely kindred spirits. As has been the case for each year since the award's inception, Tony Salen's brother, Doug, has driven down from San Francisco to Pasadena to be here for the awards presentation. And today, Doug is joined by his friend, Kim Shuck. As many of you know, the Baseball Reliquary is an organization that is deeply rooted in the arts. And so I would be remiss not to mention that Kim Shuck was recently named as the seventh poet laureate of the city of San Francisco.
So congratulations, Kim, on this very magnificent honor. And thank you, Doug, for once again taking part in our ongoing celebration of Tony's memory. I'm always thrilled to introduce the Salem Award honoree each year, but the 2017 recipient holds a very special significance to me. It has been my honor to collaborate with him on several projects over the years, and his extraordinary work ethic and commitment to community are traits that I greatly admire and strive to emulate. Dr. Richard Santian was born in East Los Angeles after World War II. His father took him and his brother to see the Los Angeles Angels of the Pacific Coast League play at Wrigley Field. He attended his first Dodger game in 1958, the first year the Dodgers played at the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum, and thus began a lifelong love affair with the boys in blue. Richard received his BA degree from Los Angeles State College, his MA from San Fernando Valley State College, and his doctoral degree in 1978 in American politics and US foreign policy from the Claremont Graduate School. He was and continues to be very active in the Chicano movement, starting with Cesar Chavez and the farm workers boycott in 1965, and has taught Chicano studies for the past 45 years in the California State University system. The last 37 years, he has been Professor Emeritus at California State Polytechnic University, Pomona. And I always joke with Richard, because as a retired professor, he teaches more classes than most currently active professors. <laughs> in fact, in addition to Cal Poly Pomona, he also teaches part-time at East Los Angeles College in both the Chicano Studies and Political Science Departments. This is a man who was born to teach and mentor, and his students should consider themselves very fortunate that education was his chosen profession. Richard was one of the founding members of the Latino Baseball History Project, which is where our paths crossed for the first time in 2004. He currently serves on the planning committee for that project, which is based at California State University San Bernardino. And while many individuals have made and continue to make important contributions to the Latino Baseball History Project, which started locally and now has grown into a national initiative, Richard has become very much its heart and soul. Since 2011, Richard has served as the lead author for the Mexican American Baseball Book Series in conjunction with the Arcadia Publishing Company. This summer, the series will release its 11th and 12th titles with books covering Houston and Southeast Texas and El Paso. At least three more titles are in progress, including Kansas City, Sacramento, and a book, a book which will be of particular interest to those living locally that will focus on Mexican-American baseball in the San Gabriel Valley. In the books published to date, nearly 2,500 vintage photographs and stories have been shared. Many of these images were scanned from family scrapbooks and discovered in boxes and dusty attics. Collectively, these images represent the most comprehensive photo documentation to be made available to the public in the history of baseball research on Mexican-American communities in the United States. And before this enters the history books as the longest introduction of a Tony Salem <laughs> Memorial Award honoree, let me conclude by sharing some fabulous news. Dr. Richard Santian and his wife, Teresa, recently donated to the baseball reliquary their Los Angeles Dodgers collection of ephemera and memorabilia, which we believe to be the largest private collection of its kind in the world. The materials will be housed at the Institute for Baseball Studies at Whittier College, where they will be used for exhibitions and for research and study by students and scholars for generations to come. As
as we unveil the 2017 Tony Salem Memorial Award, please join me in welcoming its recipient, Dr. Richard Santian. Wow, <laughs> I thought I had died. <laughs> Gee. Gee. Thank you, Terry, for that uh, very charitable uh, introduction. Um, over the last 10 years, I have probably done hundreds of community events uh, where there have been ball players and family members. And uh, I've seen a lot of friendly faces here, people that I've known for the last several years who have been very strong supporters, uh, advocates for the Mexican American Baseball Project. And as you know, at these events, I usually speak first, but I speak for about two or three minutes. I talk a little bit about the project, a little bit about the books, but then I introduce the players and their families to speak, because those are the, really the important people that we need to hear from. And so it's been a long, long time since I've actually given a a speech. And because of the um, importance of this award, I decided to, to write a speech, a very brief speech, uh, to share with you. I, I generally don't read in a speech, but I thought that, again, that this award requires that I share your thoughts, my thoughts with you, uh, in regards to this, this award. First of all, I want to thank uh, the Baseball Reliquary. I want to uh, thank the Mexican American Baseball History Project at Cal State San Bernardino, uh, the Ethnic and Women's Studies Department at Cal Poly Pomona, and also the 43 authors that I have had the fortune to work with in our first 12 books. When Terry informed me that I had been the uh, recipient this year of the Tony Salen Award, uh, I found myself going through several different types of emotions. Uh, first, I was surprised. <laughs> I was very surprised when he called. And then um, I was very excited. I was very excited because uh, this would be, in a way, a feather in the cap for the Mexican American History Baseball Project. Uh, and then I was very honored as I began to read more about Tony and about the other honorees who had received this award for the last 15 years. And now I'm very, very humbled, uh, especially after reading the contributions of Tony and the 15 previous uh, recipients. All of them, I found, are courageous storytellers who have confronted head on the one-sided story that passes tragically as baseball history, tinged, infected with racism, discrimination, and prejudice. And all of these fearless champions who have received this very esteemed award have helped cultivate new branches in baseball's family tree. Mr. Salen's creative life was filled with compassion, goodness, generosity, and kindness. And he had a very skillful and unorthodox approach to give dignity and legitimacy to those whose sports lives had been ignored underrated, and undervalued. I now realize that Tony and I are, in fact, baseball kin, that, uh, that we celebrate an immense love for baseball, uh, that we have this passion to tell the extraordinary stories about ordinary players and coaches and, and teams, and that we have this hardcore enthusiasm to write and to tell these beautiful stories. The title of one of Tony's books is called The Forgotten Heroes. It is fitting, a fitting tribute for our Mexican American baseball and softball series. Therefore, Terry, I respectively accept this highly regarded 
award on behalf of all the previously uh, forgotten Mexican-American teams, players, coaches, umpires, scorekeepers, sponsors, scouts, sports writers, team moms, and bad boys and bad girls who have brought high honor and top of the world joy to their families, their friends, their fans, and neighborhoods. Like Lou Gehrig, I too consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. Lucky to have, two, to have had two remarkable parents, Rachel and Carlos. Lucky to have two great brothers, Charles and Joe. Lucky to have three great children, Anthony, Diane, and John. Lucky to have three grandchildren who are great, uh, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, Roman, and Rhiannon and lucky that all three are now attending college, and lucky to have the greatest wife in the world, Teresa. Teresa, can you stand up? <laughs> Without her, I would not be here today accepting this special award. She has been my closest teammate during this tremendous journey regarding the long and rich history of Mexican-American baseball and softball. Thank you. Also lucky that she loves sports. Our very first date was at a Kings hockey game. <laughs> was at a Kings hockey game. And, uh, and except for a handful of the most recently built major league ballparks, uh, we have seen games at all of the existing stadiums, including 23 stadiums that no longer play major league baseball, like Candlestick Park, Jack Murphy Stadium, the Astrodome, Three River Stadium, the King Dome, Joe Robbie Stadium, Mile High Stadium, and Olympic Stadium in Montreal. Lucky, lucky to teach a Mexican-American baseball class every spring at Cal Poly Pomona. And so, so lucky to have thousands of Mexican-American players and coaches and their faithful families unselfishly share to date over 5,000 of their takeaway breath photos and astounding stories from throughout the United States. And as Terry mentioned, over 2,500 of these have already been published. And like Terry mentioned about my father taking us to our first Angels game at Wrigley Field in 56, our first Ram game in 1954 at the Coliseum. And also, I'm very lucky to have uh, this season attended my 40th consecutive Dodgers opening game. Okay. Yeah. What about those Dodgers? Huh? <laughs> best, yeah, best record in baseball. Yeah, great, best record in baseball. And like my father, I have been lucky to take our children and our grandchildren to countless hockey, basketball, and baseball games, even indoor arena football. And lucky that our kids and their kids have played a variety of organized sports. Uh, if you don't believe me, come to my garage. I've got hundreds of trophies uh, in boxes. Um, on the other hand, I didn't play sports. I never played organized sports, except once. I played on the B football team in high school in 1964. Okay, I see Coach Padilla here. Um, but I have to tell you that uh, I, I sat on the bench the whole season. I did, I sat, except for the very last game, for the very last game, on the very last play of the season, the coach put me in. And so like Moonlight Graham, I was that close. <laughs> and uh, if you don't believe me, I actually have a picture of the football team right here, and that, that's me right there, <laughs> okay? So, if, uh, if any of you want to see it or take a picture of it, uh, you can see me uh, afterwards. I have also been very lucky to have met Terry Cannon and his precious wife, Mary. I first met Terry when he invited me to speak at the Mexican American Baseball Exhibit at Cal State Los Angeles in 2006. And later, he introduced myself and Francisco Banderama to Jerry Roberts at Arcadia Publishing that led to our first groundbreaking book in 2011. And as Ter Terry has mentioned, we now have 12 books with six more forthcoming 
over the next two years, and hopefully many more after that. So Teresa, when you get mad at me, blame Terry. Okay. <laughs> okay, he's the one to blame. In summary, in summary, this book series has been my field of dreams. I believe, like Kevin Costner's character, Ray Kinsella, that I was doing this baseball work solely for the players to relive, relive their glory on the diamond one last time. But in retrospect, this book series has been my blessing, has been my stroke of luck that has spiritually brought together every treasured aspect of my life. My love for baseball and sports, my love for Mexican-American history, my love for research, writing, and teaching, my love for politics, community self-determination, self and social justice, my love for travel, and lastly, my unconditional love for my wife and family. Not even Fernando Valenzuela could beat that on his best day. <laughs> so I thank, I thank the baseball reliquary for bestowing this heartfelt pat on the back for my work. Thank you. Before we introduce our keynote speaker, I would like to mention that we have baseball royalty in our midst this afternoon. Cindy Cobb is attending her first Shrine of the Eternals induction day. She is the granddaughter of Ty Cobb, one of the game's all-time greats, and over the last few years, she has done much to change the public's perception of her grandfather. With the support of Charles Learson's well-researched book, Ty Cobb, A Terrible Beauty, Cindy has set forth evidence that refutes major falsehoods that have unfairly smeared Ty Cobb's reputation over the years, including that he was one of the game's most virulent racists, when in fact, he was a proponent of baseball's integration years before the arrival of Jackie Robinson. Where are you, Cindy? I'm not sure where you're. Thanks. There she is. <laughs> we welcome you, and we hope this is the first of many shrine ceremonies in your future. Always one of the most eagerly anticipated speeches at the Shrine of the Eternals induction day is the keynote address which this year will be delivered by Dave Mesry, a writer, historian, and preservationist based in Detroit, Michigan. Along with 2016 Hilda Award recipient Tom Derry, Dave is a founding member of the Navin Field Grounds Crew, the grassroots collective of baseball fans which work to preserve and maintain the site of Detroit's historic Tiger Stadium from 2010 to 2016. During that time, Dave served as creative consultant on Stealing Home, Jason Roach's marvelous documentary on the Navin Field grounds crew. I believe we have a few copies of that DVD available for sale in the back today. Dave is a Society of Professional Journalists award-winning writer and editor of magazines, books, and news sites, including the Detroit Metro Times and ESPN's Grantland.com. He is also the founder of the Bird Bash, Detroit's annual tribute to the late, great Mark the Bird Fidrich. Yes. A 2002 inductee to the Shrine of the Eternals. A self-described bird brain, Dave has written extensively about the right-handed pitcher who, as a 21-year-old phenom in 1976, took the nation by storm on his way to being named the American League Rookie of the Year. Dave was also the subject of Emmy Award-winning director Gary Glazer's Motor City Memoir Project, and in 2009 was the first in Detroit to grace the stage at National Public Radio's critically acclaimed storytelling series, The Moth. Along with the other volunteer members of the Navin Field grounds crew, 
Dave is now collaborating with the nonprofit Friends of Historic Hamtramck Stadium, helping to restore an old Negro League ballpark near Detroit. And incidentally, in 1930, when Hamtramck Stadium opened, Ty Cobb threw out the ceremonial first pitch. Please welcome to the lectern to deliver the Shrine of the Eternals 2017 keynote address direct from the Motor City, Dave Mesri. Hello. <laughs> nice place you have here, Terry. Uh, it's, 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 it's great to be here today. It's a little nerve-wracking, but it's great to be here today and see all your friendly faces here at the Baseball Reliquary. Um, you know, as Terry knows, it's a, it's a long way from Detroit to Pasadena. <laughs> it's been a long, strange trip. As I'm sure you know, baseball takes you to some of the most unlikely places with the unlikeliest of people. I wouldn't be here today in, Jack in Jackie Robinson's hometown if it weren't for Ernie Hartwell, if it weren't for Willie Horton, if it weren't for Tom Derry and the Navy Field Grounds crew. I wouldn't be here on the birthday of Shoeless Joe Jackson if it wasn't for the spirit of Tiger Stadium. I like that hat. It was Shoeless Joe who christened Tiger Stadium over 100 years ago, <clears throat> back when it was known as Navin Field. In that first game in the top of the first inning, on April 20th, 1912, Shoeless Joe scores the first run. And not to be outdone, in the bottom of the first inning, the Tigers score their first run at Navin Field when Ty Cobb steals home. And for years, that old ballpark at the corner of Michigan and Trumbull was a mecca for many of us in Detroit. But as Camp Heron knows, it wasn't always a mecca for African Americans who were forced to play in their own leagues simply because of the color of their skin. <clears throat> I grew up on the east side of Detroit. <clears throat> My father, son of Syrian immigrants from Damascus, taught me the game of baseball, taught me about Earl Wilson, Gates Brown, and Willie Horton, taught me about Joe Lewis and Louis Armstrong. We lived on the east side on Nottingham Street. On the next street over was an ex-con who somehow made it out of Jackson State Prison and into the Tigers starting lineup. His name was Ron LaFleur. Mickey Lolich lived in that neighborhood. Just a few blocks over was a notorious white boy, Rick. As one of the few Middle Eastern kids in my neighborhood and in my school, I was subjected to a fair amount of ridicule. Kids called me Arab, towel head, camel jockey. You can guess the rest. And as hard as I tried, never really, never really fit in. Always felt like a square peg in a round hole. I feel like I kind of fit in here with the baseball reliquarians. <laughs> <laughs> this 
So, you know, back there in Detroit, Tiger Stadium, where I met Tom Derry for the first time back in 2010 after they had demolished the place, and where I met his wife, Sarah Derry, where I met so many former Tigers who came out to see us, to see what we were doing, picking up the garbage and cutting the trash, picking up the trash and cutting the lawn, and restoring it from a field of weeds to a field of dreams again. And we, we saw Mickey Lolich came out to see us one day. Johnny, Johnny Walkenfuss came out. Alan Trammell and Lou Whitaker stopped by to say hello. Time after time, these old timers came out and, and, and just blew our minds. Willie Horton himself showed up one day, and he hadn't been there in years. He, didn't, he hadn't been there since the final game in 1999. It, Tiger Stadium is gone, and it's never coming back. But for anybody who ever set foot in the place, its spirit lives on. It's a uniquely American ballpark in a uniquely American town. I think the, Tiger, the, the story of Tiger Stadium is really the story of Detroit. It's the story of America. It's where immigrants from all over the world came to learn this quintessentially American game we love so much. It's where the Jews came to see Hank Greenberg, where Italians came to see Rocky Calavito, where Latinos came to see Ozzy Virgil. In the 1960s and 70s, when the Red Sox were in town, it's where the Arabs came to see Joe LaHood. And after the Tigers signed Jake Wood and Willie Horton and Gates Brown, it's a place where African Americans can finally come and see one of their own wearing the old English D. Now, one of those fans who used to come there all the time in the 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s was an auto worker, a black auto worker at Ford Motor Company. He catches the bus to the ballpark all the time to sit in the bleachers and watch Willie Horton and Gates Brown and Earl Wilson. And out there in the bleachers, he's practically anonymous. He's a soft-spoken guy, and he works at the Ford Roost plant, same place, same time, as a young Barry Gordy. But he's not just any auto worker. He's an old ball player, and he still loves the game. He was a center fielder back in his day, and in fact, this guy, he hit the most home runs in Negro League history. His name was Turkey Stearns. In the 1920s and 30s, Norman Turkey Stearns played for the Negro National League Detroit Stars. And starting in 1930, he played at a ballpark called Hamtramck Stadium. This was the home of the Detroit Stars. In this little town, in the middle of a big town, maybe 20,000 people in Hamtramck, Mission, Michigan. It's where Josh Gibson came and played. Satchel Paige and Cool Papa Bell. And for the grand opening of Hamtramck Stadium in 1930, they asked this middle-aged white guy from Georgia to catch a train to Detroit and throw out the first pitch at the Negro Leagues ballpark. And he does. And it's Ty Cobb. But Hamtramck Stadium wasn't just a place for the Negro Leagues. After Jackie Robinson breaks the color line in 1947, Hamtramck Stadium is still in use for community baseball, high school games, church leagues, American Legion, Little League games. There's a Little League field right there in the same park out in center field. And it's where a big Polish kid by the name of Art Pinky Darris 
leads the 1959 Hamtramck Little League team to the Little League World Series. And to this day, Pinky Darris is still called the greatest Little Leaguer there ever was. Now by the 1990s, Hamtramck Stadium falls into disrepair. The grandstand gets scaled down and fenced off and it's covered in graffiti. And eventually, it comes to my attention that it's still there and it's still standing. Which, standing here even today, I still can't believe, but it's there. Now, Hamtramck today, it's a complex, fascinating town. There's about 20,000 people right there in the middle of Detroit. It's like its own neighborhood. It's got its own mayor, its own city council. Like I said, a small town smack dab in the middle of the big one. It was once home to, to Germans and Poles and African Americans. It continues to evolve and its changing face is the face of America. Now, there are still Poles and African Americans in Hamtramck today and hipsters of all ages playing their music, making their art, and living their lives. And now there are immigrants from all over the world, from Yemen and Syria and Bangladesh. Now the mayor of Hamtramck, she's Polish. The majority of city council are Muslims. And right there in the middle of it all is this old Negro Leagues ballpark. One of five or six still left in America. And it's still standing. Now kids in Hamtramck today, they play a lot of soccer, play a lot of cricket, play a lot of football. And while baseball might not be America's pastime anymore, it is still a quintessentially American game. And so you can bet Hamtramck High School still has its own baseball team. Their coach, Adam Mused, is Yemeni. His players are Yemenis, Bangladeshis, Bosnians, and Poles. One of the kids is half Mexican, half Arabic. Coach Mused calls him the world team. I call him America's team. Like I said, I, I, I didn't realize until relatively recently that Hamtramck Stadium was still standing. But it is. And up until about a year ago, I didn't even realize this place existed. I didn't know who Terry Cannon was. Buddy killed Chesty. But man, there's, the, there's, there's a place in the world, right here in Pasadena, for guys like Doc Ellis and Bill Spaceman Lee, and my all-time favorite, Mark the Bird Fidrich. And I, I just starting to realize that so many ball players who came through Detroit over the years would fit in right here. Guys like Turkey Stearns and Pinky Darris, Dave Rosma and Johnny Walkenfuss, Hank Aguirre and Ron LaFleur. And while they might never get into Cooperstown, I think maybe there's a place here for the longest serving keystone combination in Major League history. Alan Trammell and Lou Whitaker. <laughs> I learned about so many of these guys from listening to my father and listening to Ernie Harwell on the radio. When you guys had Vin Scully out here, we had Ernie Harwell back in Detroit and they both got their start in Brooklyn. 
I want to tell you a little story about my first ball game. The night the Tigers won the pennant in 1968, my parents are sitting in the lower deck of the left field stands. Don Wirt singles in the winning run, and the place goes bananas. Ernie Harwell calls it. He says, K-Line has scored. The fans are streaming on the field. They're mobbing downward at first base. And the Tigers have won their first pennant since 1945. Let's listen to the bedlam here at Tiger Stadium. And from where I was sitting, that's all I could do. <laughs> I had the obstructive view seat that day. My mother was five months pregnant. <laughs> so while I, I couldn't see, I couldn't see Don Wirt hit a single. I couldn't see Al Kaline cross home plate. I couldn't see Ernie Harwell up in the broadcast booth. But I did what Ernie said. I listened to the bedlam there at Tiger Stadium. And I think it was right then and there, I think it was right then and there that, you know, the spirit of baseball came to me. <laughs> and it stayed with me even after all these, all these people were gone from my life, after they left the Tigers and after they left this earth. And it stayed with me until 1999, when the Tigers played their final game at Tiger Stadium. And after the game, all these old Tigers, they come out in uniform, and they go back to their positions on the field. Out comes George Kell, and they take him over to third base. Out comes Willie Horton, and he walks right over to left field. And like my parents were back in 68, I'm sitting there in the lower deck of the left field stands, and Willie's crying, and Larry Herndon's crying, and everybody's crying. And there's a sign in the upper deck, and it's hanging there, and it says, today there is crying in baseball. And everybody that day at Tiger Stadium <laughs> broke the cardinal rule and cried in baseball. But the first one to come out of the tunnel that day is Mark the Bird Fidrich. I had seen him moments before in the stands, and he's in street clothes, and he's hot, and it's sweating, and he's wearing shorts, and I'm wearing a Fitters jersey, and he sees it, and he puts his arm around me. I put my arm around him, and he's up here. <laughs> and I'm so tickled to see him, and he seems equally tickled to see me, and I say, thanks for coming back, Bird, you know, all the way from tiny Northboro, Massachusetts. And he says, well, thank you, and, and, and he disappears into the crowd, and then an inning or two later, he's running on the field, and he's back in uniform, and it's the year of the bird all over again. And he runs out to the pitcher's mound where he ruled the roost back in 76, where he used to get down on his hands and knees and groom the mound with his hands. And he kneels down and he reaches in his back pocket and he pulls out a Ziploc baggie and he scoops up a handful of dirt and fills it up to take home with him back to Massachusetts. And there's a picture of Turkey Stearns in his final days in 1979, and he's standing at home plate at Tiger Stadium. This is a place where he was never allowed to play because of the color of his skin. And Turkey's just staring out into the outfield where he sat as a spectator for so many days in the bleachers. And you can see in his eyes the story of the Negro Leagues. It's the story of, of the triumph of determination over discrimination and the triumph of dignity over despair. You'll see the picture and you'll see that look in his eyes. I think all these things have led me to, to believe that I, I, 
Well, I, I think it all boils down to this, that, that place matters. If there's some place that matters to you, whether it's an old library or an old house or an old ballpark, it's a place worth fighting for. And like I said, baseball takes it to the unlikeliest of places with the unlikeliest of people. And so in 2009, when Mark the Bird Fidrich dies, I realize I must go to Northboro, Massachusetts. This little town, 45 minutes west of Boston, right outside of Worcester, Mass. It's a little town I always wanted to visit, but I never got around to it until I got the word that the bird was gone. So I hop on a plane, and I fly out east, and I find myself in this tiny little town where Mark the Bird Fidrich was born and raised. And I find the church, and it's jam-packed, and there's a line outside a mile long, but somehow I manage to get myself in, and I stand in the back of the church. And up there on the altar is a Mark the Bird Fidrich jersey, and, and there's not a dry eye in the house. And who should be there? all the way from Detroit to give the eulogy, but Willie Horton. So after the funeral, I stumble out into the streets of Northboro, and I wander over to Main Street, and I come upon what looks like an old abandoned gas station. And I think to myself, I wonder if this was Pierce's gas station. Because I remembered the story that when the bird signed his first major league contract, he was pumping gas at a place called Pierce's. And the story goes, he's 19 years old, it's 1974, and his father comes up and says, Maki, you don't have to work here anymore. And the bird looks at his dad and says, what do you mean? He says, you've just, you just been drafted by the Detroit Tigers. And then I look up and I see a man walking down the street in a black suit, about yay high, looks like Robin Williams. And I figure this guy's from around here. He'll, he'll know if that was Pierce's gas station. And I don't want to bother him, but just before he gets out of earshot, I say, excuse me, sir. I'm sorry to bother you, but was that Pierce's gas station? He looks at me and says, yeah, that was Pierce's. You're not from around here? <laughs> I said, no. And he looks, and I'm wearing a sport coat, and he says, were you just at the church? I said, I was. He said, are you from Detroit? I said, I am. And he says, my name is Stevie Graham. I grew up here with Maki playing Little League ball, Legion ball. I've known him all his life. You want to buy me a coffee? <laughs> so Stevie Graham and I walk into the Dunkin' Donuts, and I buy him a coffee. And he sits down and starts telling me what it's like to live in Northboro, Massachusetts, and to know Mark the Bird Fidrich all your life and what it's like to see this guy go from your lovable neighbor to Monday Night Baseball, standing in his stock and feet talking to Bob Euchre on Monday Night Baseball. And then he tells me his nickname. Stevie Graham, turns out Stevie Graham is a hell of a poker player, and he's always beating his buddies at poker. So they call him the Brain. So Stevie the Brain Graham says, hey, you got a car? I said, yeah. He says, uh, how'd you like a tour in Northboro? I said, I love it. So we get in the car, I get behind the wheel, and we start driving around the hometown of Mark the Bird Fidrich. First place we come to is a little house. He says, you see that place there? I said, yeah. He says, that's where Maki grew up. Right there in this house, that's right, this very house right here. We drive around a little more. 
and we drive by a farm. And I look in and he doesn't have to say anything because I know whose farm it is. And I can see in the distance a big red Mac, a big red Mac truck parked right outside his garage. And I know whose truck it is. And then we drive around a little more and he says, there's one more place I gotta show you. And so we drive around town a little bit and we end up at a little ballpark called Memorial Field. There's a little league diamond there and there's a major league diamond. And he says, this is where we grew up playing ball, man. This is where Maki and I learned the game. And I'm in awe. And then Stevie the Brain Graham walks over into a maintenance building and he grabs a groundskeeper. And he says, hey, Tommy, I want you to meet somebody. This is uh, my buddy Dave. He came all the way from Detroit for Maki's funeral. And he says, hey, you got a, you got a Ziploc baggie? He says, yeah, let's go get me a Ziploc baggie. So this groundskeeper goes back in the building. He comes out with a, with a plastic bag. And the brain tells him, go get some dirt from the mound. So I'm standing there with Stevie the Brain Graham in Northboro, Massachusetts, the hometown of Mark the Bird Fidrich, and I watch this groundskeeper go out to the mound, get down on his hands and knees, scoop up a handful of dirt, and put it in the Ziploc bag. Then I look at Stevie the Brain Graham and I think, holy shit. I said, Brain, I've got something for you. He says, what do you got? I brought something with me from Detroit. And I didn't know why I brought it or what I was gonna do with it until that very moment. And so I reached in my pocket and I pulled out another bag of dirt and I gave it to Stevie Graham. And he looks at me and says, is that what I think it is? I said, it is. He says, is that from Tiger Stadium? I said, it is. He goes, is that from the fucking pitcher's mound? <laughs> I was like, I'm sorry, no, it's from the left field line. It's the best I could do. <laughs> so he takes his bag of dirt, I take my bag of dirt, we hug, we go our separate ways, and I go back to Detroit, and it's, it's that, it's that, the magic of baseball. And then, just a few weeks later, they tear down what's left of historic Tiger Stadium. They had saved a portion of it from first base to third base, and the plan was to reincorporate this into a new development. It was gonna be this great historic reuse of an old Major League ballpark, but it wasn't meant to be. So they tear it down. And shortly thereafter, like Hamtramck Stadium did in the 90s, the site of Tiger Stadium falls into disrepair. Pretty soon it's a 10 acre vacant lot, it's riddled with garbage, and there's weeds six, seven feet tall. And then Ernie Harwell dies. And so I think, well, they, they, they lay Ernie Harwell out at Comerica Park so people can come and pay their last respects. But the line's too long, I don't want to go there. I want to go to Tiger Stadium. I want to go to Navin Field. And I go there, and there's people out there playing catch in the middle of all these weeds and garbage, remembering Ernie and remembering the spirit of Tiger Stadium. And I meet a guy there, last year's Hilda Award winner, Tom Derry. And next thing you know, we got this thing, the Navin Field grounds crew, and we're cutting the grass, and we're picking up the garbage, and it's crazy. And it's six years of this crazy saga of trying to preserve an old ballpark. It's gone now, though. But there's another ballpark that needs restoring. And it's right there in the middle of Detroit, in this little city called Hamtramck, Michigan. I can't tell you how pleased I am to be here with you today in the hometown of Jackie Robinson. And like I said, it's been a long, strange trip for a Syrian-American kid from the east side of Detroit. 
Now, I'm not much of a scholar like Terry or Albert or a researcher like Dr. Santian and Dr. Ravel or these guys in Detroit I know, Rod Nelson and Gary Gillette. But as best as I can tell, in the history of the game, there have only been two major league players of Middle Eastern descent. And there hasn't been one in more than 30 years. Not since Sammy Khalifa played shortstop for the Pittsburgh Pirates. And that all got me to thinking, you know, I'm, while I'm proud to be with you here today at the baseball reliquary, I think I'll be even more proud and more pleased when I look out between the lines of a Major League Diamond and see a Middle Eastern face in baseball again. There's a kid out there somewhere just waiting to be discovered. Maybe he's Yemeni, like Adam, you said. Maybe he's Lebanese, like Joe Lahoud. Maybe he's even a Muslim, like Sammy Khalifa. And maybe, just maybe, He's from Hamtramck, Michigan. Thank you. Following up on Dave Mesry's keynote address, I would like to mention that as part of the Baseball Reliquary's Game Changers exhibition, going on now through July 30th in this library, you can view a gallery of 18 11 by 14 inch black and white photographs taken by Tom Haggerty at Tiger Stadium between 1976 and 1979. During this time period, Haggerty frequently visited Tiger Stadium with his camera and produced one of the most extraordinary documentations of the life and times of a venerable ballpark that I have ever seen. The strength of the work is not as a chronicle of the action on the field, but rather as a window into the fans' experience, waiting outside the stadium, entering the park, and watching the game in the bleachers. The display is in the Centennial Room, which is located at the east end of the library. And now it is time to commence with the induction of our 2017 electees to the Shrine of the Eternals and the unveiling and presentation of the inductee plaques. The three individuals that we honor today were elected by the membership of the Baseball Reliquary in voting conducted in April and they received the highest number of votes from a ballot consisting of 50 candidates. Two identical plaques have been assembled in honor of each inductee, one which is presented to the inductee and one which becomes part of the permanent collection of the baseball reliquary and is used for exhibition purposes. I would also like to acknowledge the presence of William Scaff, former Pasadena resident, artist, and longtime reliquarian, who back in 1999 designed the acrylic plaques we present annually to our inductees. And Bill also designed both the Hilda and Tony Salen Memorial Awards. So Bill, are you here? Yes. Thank you. It has been said there are few certainties in life, most notably death, taxes, and Charlie Brown's team getting trounced every summer. <laughs> As you know, one of the primary differences between the Hall of Fame and the Shrine of the Eternals is that the Hall honors statistical accomplishment, whereas the Shrine of the Eternals throws statistics and record books out the window. Therefore, Charlie Brown's statistical inadequacies as well as those of fellow inductee Bob Euchre, make them perfectly suited for the shrine. 
Think about how many times Charlie's makeshift ball club was on the wrong side of scores like 123 to nothing. <laughs> now being a cartoon world, career one loss statistics are a little hard to tabulate. Although one researcher believes that Charles M. Schultz's Peanuts gang won two games and lost 930. <laughs> with the two wins coming as a result of forfeits. <laughs> Another researcher contends that Charlie Brown was stripped to his shorts at least 100 times on balls hit back through the pitcher's mound. Although miraculously, he was hit by a line drive only once, to which a certain female right fielder said that was the only thing that could knock some sense into him. Fortunately, for those who regularly followed the Peanuts morality tales, it didn't. 2017 marked the 10th year that Charlie Brown had been on the Shrine of the Eternals ballot. Every year he moved a little closer to gaining enough votes to be elected, only to be edged out by a few votes here and a few votes there. It had been discussed and debated among reliquarians that maybe this was an entirely appro appropriate fate for Charlie Brown the ultimate failure for the stocky, round-headed kid to come so close to enshrinement and yet fail to get in. After all, this is a ball player who kept swinging and missing for five decades. A ball player who had one distinguishing feature, an extreme and utter lack of talent. <laughs> but finally, this year, thanks to the benevolent membership of the baseball reliquary, Charlie Brown's perseverance, imparted to him by his creator, Charles M. Schultz, has finally paid off. Against all odds, today we can say that Charlie Brown is truly an eternal. And right about now, I can hear mild-mannered Charlie responding to all his naysayers. Tell your statistics to shut up. <laughs> We are delighted to have Craig Schultz introduce and accept the induction of Charlie Brown on behalf of the Schultz family. The youngest son of Charles M. Schultz, Craig is president and CEO of Creative Associates, the Santa Rosa, California-based company that helps manage the licensing and use of Charlie Brown and the Peanuts gang. He also serves on the board of directors of the Charles M. Schultz Museum and Research Center. Craig is an avid aviator and ran his own charter flight company out of Santa Rosa for 20 years. And in a Shrine of the Eternals first, Craig flew down to Pasadena from Santa Rosa this morning in his own plane to attend the festivities. As we unveil Charlie Brown's induction plaque and welcome him to the Shrine of the Eternals, Please give a warm round of applause to Craig Schultz. Uh, that's fantastic, Terry. Thank you so much for having me here. And uh, nice to see so many baseball fans in one spot. You're know, listening to Cam talk. It took me back to my childhood, back when uh, in the early 60s. I see a lot of you guys were probably around in the early 60s. Um, <clears throat> my brother and I were both huge baseball fans. My dad would take us to numerous baseball games, mainly the Giants, where we got to actually meet Mays, McCovey, and so forth. And uh, my brother was a big collector. Before collectors were, pop were popular, he was one that would collect baseball cards. And my dad would give us a quarter. We'd go downtown. And for a quarter, we could go to the local grocery store. And for five bucks, you'd get a pack of five baseball cards and a stick of gum that was stale and disgusting and would break and you could barely chew the thing. But out of those, out of those five cards, you would dig through and try to find the great ones within those. Well, my brother had a whole drawer full of those cards that went way back. And he had names like the rookie, you know, the original rookie card of Mantle, Marth, uh, Mays, McCovey, Koufax. And he treasured all those cards. 
And me on the other hand, I was playing baseball at the same time I was getting into motocross, I had my bicycle and so forth. And the only trouble with bicycles were that they made no noise. And I know what you're thinking. So my brother would go to sleep at night, I would open that drawer up, go, ah, Mickey Mantle, this will make great sound on my bicycle. <laughs> and I don't know how many great cards I destroyed, but it probably was thousands of dollars worth at this point. Um, and, he, and he lost all those cards, he had thousands of them. Anyhow, Charlie Brown has asked you to come here today to accept this great honor on his behalf. It is not often that he receives such great recognition. <laughs> he asked me to pass on his congratulations to the other recipients here today. He would love to have been here, but his team is having another terrible season. <laughs> right now, they're 0 and 19, and he just thought it was best to stay home and make them practice. Now, out of almost 18,000 comic strips my dad drew, the one theme that echoed the most throughout those years, those 50 years, was baseball. An astounding 1,995 comic strips were based on baseball. Of course, that is no surprise, of course, because my dad is a child. He was raised and played on the vacant lots of St. Paul. With his ragtag team would take on all challengers. And he soon knew what it was like to lose a game 100 to nothing. And he would pass these tales on to us as children. But all that early childhood agony would later become comic strip gold that we could enjoy for a few seconds every morning as we read our local paper. It may seem odd that a place known to honor the best of baseball, you choose to honor someone famous for being the worst at it. <laughs> However, let me remind you, it's not all Charlie Brown's fault. Remember, he has to deal with a team like none other. Not even Bruce Bochy could make this team into winners. <laughs> He's got a crazy beagle at shortstop that all he thinks of himself and where his next meal is coming from. A second baseman who refuses to leave his blanket at home and at the slightest whim, we'll gather the team at the mound to discuss theology. No pitcher has to deal with that in the major leagues. A catcher that is more concerned about being able to play Beethoven than being able to play baseball. And a third baseman you can barely see through all the dust. Yet Charlie Brown, good old Charlie Brown, he refuses to trade any of them. It's important to point out that not only is he the starting pitcher, and their worst batter, he's a team manager as well, and a groundbreaking manager at that. Well before Title IX passed, back in 1972, he recruited girls on his team. <laughs> Lucy, the ever crabby loudmouth in right field, who shows no empathy for what he has to deal with. And then you've got Frida and Violet, who are either too busy picking daisies or discussing how the wind is messing up her naturally curly hair. I'm reminded of a strip that anyone who plays baseball, pro or amateur, can all relate to. And it goes something like this. Charlie Brown again, in the first panel, is losing terribly, 55 to nothing. The fans are slowly leaving the stands early. They see little chance for a comeback. After all, this is Charlie Brown's team. It starts to rain. Charlie Brown looks up and sees a little red-haired girl stand up and leave. The rain gets worse. The field is flooding. Snoopy paddles by on his surfboard <laughs> as he leaves the field. Linus makes an umbrella out of his blanket and walks past the mound, mumbling something about Moses parting the seas. <laughs> and then in the fourth panel comes the line that only someone like Charlie Brown, the eternal optimist, would say at a moment like this. 
Where's everyone going? It's not over yet! <laughs> we have to admire Charlie Brown. We really, really do. I've had those days when all things are going terribly wrong, whether in sports or in life in general. And I felt like throwing my hands up and just walking away. It is those moments that I look to Charlie Brown for inspiration, as we all should, for he continues to play on when most would quit. Why, you may ask? One word, hope. The hope that few of us will ever have, that someday will be his day, the day he pitches a no-hitter or hits a winning run, the day he becomes the team's hero. And it is for that reason that I'm so honored that you have inducted Charlie Brown into this Hall of Fame. For in my eyes, after 50 years of losing, no one deserves it more than Charlie Brown. Thank you all. And speaking of baseball royalty, we are also pleased to have in our audience today, Adrian Bratton, who is the daughter of pioneering umpire Emmett Ashford, the first African-American umpire in both minor and major league baseball, and a Shrine of the Eternals inductee in 2008. Adrian recently donated a collection of her father's memorabilia and ephemera to the baseball reliquary, and a number of items are currently on display in the north entrance cases of this library as part of our Game Changers exhibition. So when you are departing the library today, if you're going out the north entrance, make sure to view that display. Adrian, uh, are you still here? Could you stand? Oh, there she is in the back. Thank you so much for joining us today, Adrian. Our second inductee, Bob Euchre, was elected to the Shrine of the Eternals in his second year on the ballot. Bob is unable to attend today's festivities as he is in the broadcast booth at Miller Park calling the Philadelphia Phillies-Milwaukee Brewers game. Bob has asked that I extend his appreciation to the membership of the baseball reliquary for his election to the Shrine and he has asked Jay Johnstone to both introduce and to accept the induction on his behalf. Jay, uh, are you here? I'm here. Jay's here, okay. All right, uh, I'm gonna give a brief, let me give a brief intro. A former, a former major league outfielder, author, and raconteur, Jay Johnstone played for eight teams during a 20-year big league career between 1966 and 1985, including stints with both of the local clubs, the Angels and Dodgers. He is the proud owner of two World Series rings with the 1978 Yankees and 1981 Dodgers. Wherever Jay played, he made it his responsibility to keep the players laughing, and he was widely recognized as one of the game's craftiest pranksters and best storytellers. After his playing days, Jay parlayed his sense of humor and outgoing personality into a career as a broadcaster, actor, and author. He worked as a color commentator for the Yankees and Phillies, and even hosted his own television talk show. He made a cameo appearance in the memorable 1988 film, The Naked Gun, one of six acting credits to his name. He has authored three books, each of which has encapsulated his unique sense of humor. And the titles are Temporary Insanity, Over the Edge, and Some of My Best Friends Are Crazy. There's a few in here. <laughs> 
We are delighted to have him join us today to share his insights and observations on Bob Euchre. As we unveil Bob's induction plaque, please give a warm welcome to Jay Johnstone. Thank you very much. That's very nice. My wife was here. She'd go, oh, don't clap for him. He don't deserve it. <laughs> I'm working on her now. It's getting better. But I, I wanted to come here because um, I was a broadcaster uh, for several teams. And in fact, I wrote some of the teams down. I got to broadcast with the Braves, the Yankees, the Phillies, the Dodgers, the Cardinals, the Pirates, the Padres, the Oakland A's, Montreal. You name one, I went, I went somewhere. Okay, so that was fun. But when I had the opportunity to represent Bob, who was an outstanding individual, and uh, between him and the broadcaster for the New York Yankees, I would listen to and, and ask for different things and ways to be better and what can you do to improve yourself and stuff like that. And all those guys that I went to, all the different broadcasters from the different teams, they all added information to help me uh, become a broadcaster. Unfortunately, now I'm a house cleaner with my wife and do all the yard work. <laughs> so, but uh, I do want to tell you that uh, Bob Eucher, uh, is one outstanding individual and a very, very funny man. I've attended a few places where he's done some of his uh, sideshows and some of his uh, things that he pranks and things that he pulls on people. And he's really a funny, funny guy. But the thing about that admires me about Bob most, he gave me the names of the announcers that he learned from, that he enjoyed, that he talks to him and that help make him a better announcer. And I'm going to read off a couple for you. I don't want to take too much of your time because we've been here already. He thinks the world of Vin Scully. He called him the 85-year-old Dodge treasure. These are some of his favorite announcers, Jack Buck and Harry Carey. Two guys. And then, there, then we go to Chicago and you got Burt Wilson and Milo Hamilton. And he thinks a great deal and gives him a lot of credit that helped him in his career. So here's a guy that does a great job, and he goes around praising all these other announcers. So the Yankees announcer, uh, John Sterling, John learned from Bob Euchre. And uh, Sterling does a great job with the Yankees. Uh, I had a chance to be a little bit with him for about, oh, three months or so. Did some work with uh, John Sterling. But uh, some of the guys that I've met myself, um, with the Montreal team, the Oakland A's, the Padres, the Pirates, the Cardinals, the Dodgers, the Phillies, the Yankees, and the Braves. I've played with them all and done some broadcast work with them. So you deserve a great honor. And some of the things that, uh, I guess I can tell them, they're kind of funny, really. <laughs> oh, yeah. He, uh, he's quite the character, I will say that. But uh, where's that? I gave you his favorite announcers, the one that he, he uh, got a lot of info with that helped him do things. But uh, here's a guy. I want to make sure I get this right here. So it's taking me a little longer. Well, here it said, in six seasons, as a major league catcher, almost all of it and most of it as a backup catcher, you batted exactly 200. <laughs> 200. My daughter bats over 200. <laughs> In 297 games, 217 starts, he got only 146 hits, hit 14 home runs, but then he drove in 74 runs. Anybody with ability can play in the big leagues, he said, but to be able to trick people year after year after year <laughs> out the way I did, I think that would be a much greater feat. And he once said, in truth, he was a solid defensive catcher with a career fielding percentage of 981, which is fabulous. Okay. He also, uh, 
got a, was going to play in the World Series, he ended up being back up to Tim McCarver. There's no way that Tim McCarver can outdo Bob Euchre, because I've played with Tim McCarver, okay? And I won't tell you how many balls kept going back to the backstop, but how many people we got in here? It's about as many. Okay. <laughs> so, that's why they let Tim McCarver go, okay? You know, I'm only kidding. He's not a bad guy. Not a bad guy. He said, you could joke that the highlight of his major league career was when he walked with the bases loaded to drive in the winning run in an inner squad game in spring training. <laughs> That was a big game for him, okay? Also, he said, on being intentionally walked by Sandy Koufax, he joked, I was uh, pretty proud of that till I heard that the commissioner wrote Koufax a letter telling him that next time something like that happens, he was gonna fine him. <laughs> so, uh, there's, there's a lot of stick that goes on. You've been here a lot, and I've got a lot of paperwork I could talk about, but I will say one thing. As an announcer, you couldn't find a better friend, a better helper if you're an upcoming trying to be an announcer, and a better guy to be around in Major League Baseball. So I want you to all know that, uh, like I said, there's a whole lot of things about Bob Euchre that people don't realize. And I wish he could have been here with you today. He has some wonderful stories to tell, too. And he's a very funny guy, but just some of the stuff that he did when he was younger was amazing. So. There's my wife calling me right now. <laughs> Things never change, huh, guys? <laughs> oh, yeah. And I told you that he, well, his thoughts about uh, Jack Buck, Harry Carey, Milo Hamilton, those were some of his favorite announcers when he was growing up. And when he would go to the different ballparks, he always talked to the other announcers to get ideas, and that's what makes him so good. But anyway, I, I've got a whole period of stuff here I've got, I could talk on, but I just wanted to thank you for inviting me here because it is fun to be able to get up here and talk to you about baseball, but talk to you about a guy that I revered when I first broke in as an announcer, and, he, and some of the teams that I went to, he was very help, helpful in getting me to those teams to be announcing and also to be part of it. So I wanted to let you know that uh, I appreciate his efforts on behalf of me, I want to thank you all for being here. Los Angeles folk singer and music historian Ross Altman is one of Southern California's cultural treasures. He appeared on this same stage three years ago and performed a song that he had written to honor the induction of Steve Bilko. That song is featured in Ross's wonderful CD entitled The National Pastime, which also includes songs about Lou Gehrig, Babe Ruth, Mickey Mantle, Jackie Robinson, Jimmy Pearsall, and other baseball greats. That CD, incidentally, is available for purchase at the Reliquary Merchandise table at the back of the auditorium. Today we are in for a special treat. As a prelude to the introduction of our third and final inductee, we are delighted to welcome back to the stage Ross Alton, who will perform Vin Scully from the Bleachers, a brand new song he has written for today's festivities. Come on, 
received the highest voting percentage of any inductee in the 19-year history of these elections. Introducing and accepting the induction of Vin Scully will be Lisa Nia Saxon. Lisa is a trailblazing sports writer who worked as a beat reporter and sports columnist for daily newspapers in Southern California for more than two decades. Lisa covered the Angels, Dodgers, Raiders, and major college football and basketball. When she was one of only three women in North America who covered a Major League Baseball full-time from 1983 to 1987, sexual harassment and gender discrimination were accepted aspects of the workplace status quo for women. Lisa endured incomprehensible abuse, but she steadfastly fought for equal access and equal pay, paving the way for women who followed her. She is currently an adjunct professor teaching sports media at Santa Monica College and just finished her sixth and final year as the journalism advisor at Palisades Charter High School, where she will return this fall as the assistant athletic director. To introduce the induction of Vin Scully into the Shrine of the Eternals, please welcome to the lectern Lisa Nia Saxon. tell you, I feel like I'm with family today. I'm sitting here among you and I feel like I finally found my niche after years of being that outcast. Uh, Dave, I have to let you know you carry around a bag of dirt, but throughout high school I wore a necklace around my neck and it had washers and uh, bolts on it. They were the spare parts for the big red machine. <laughs> And my grandfather, my grandfather thought it was just so funny. And so he went to Akron and he bought a little uh, miniature wrench and he bought a miniature screwdriver and a miniature hammer and he put it on a chain and he said, here are the tools you need, sweetheart. He actually called me sister. <laughs> so I'm just honored to be here today. And since we're family, I'm gonna ask all of you to have your little bells ready because I might just ask you to ring them a time or two. Is that okay? I'm not breaking protocol, am I, Terry? Good, 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 good. Okay, well, I wanted to thank all of you for coming here on a lovely Sunday when we might otherwise be at the ballpark. Frankly, I'm humbled that I've been asked to share a few stories about our good friend, Vin Scully, and to accept his induction into the Shrine of the Eternals. And if you can keep this just between us, 
If Finn were here today, I'm pretty sure that he would tip his hat to Charlie Brown and to Bob Euchre, his fellow inductees in this distinguished class of 2017. And he might even pass along a few tips for Charlie Brown as to how to win the affection of that little red-haired girl. <laughs> I wish, uh, and to Bob Euchre, he'd tell him, you know what, there isn't a bad seat in the house, the last row's just fine. And Jay Johnstone, I know that uh, you brought more joy to Vin uh, than uh, anyone could imagine. Having you in a clubhouse made the day fun, so let's give a little ring for Jay Johnstone. I just love the fact that I got through my career with the Dodgers without getting hot-footed or having fart spray sprayed on me. Thank you so much. It was always easier for me to go in a clubhouse when I knew you were there. You and Jerry Royce always had my back, and I just love you for that. Um, I know, let's give another little bit. I just love this. You know, and finally, I suspect that Vin being Vin would stand up here and insist that he should be thanking us for allowing him to be a part of our lives for so long. It's just the kind of guy he is. Well, Vin, if you choose to believe that, that's fine with me. But I have a different perspective based on our relationship which dates, oh my gosh, I gasped to think about it, nearly 50 years. Vin taught me, and I suspect a lot of us here, quite a bit about baseball and life. And today I'm going to share a few of my favorite stories. Um, some of the things he taught me are small and some are large. I'll start with the small and work toward the large. I can't honestly recall who won that game between the Devil Rays and the Dodgers, but I do know that the Rays have the largest brains of any of the th uh, 32,000 species of fish that have been identified, and that the fastest fish are the sailfish, the swordfish, and the marlin. Those little devils can get up to 70 miles an hour, which all of us can only dream of doing on the highway, right? How do I know all these things? Vin taught them to me. During other games, he taught me about beards and about pirates. And on the 4th of July, he gave what can only be described as a dissertation on the US flag, dropping in nuggets at the top of each inning. It might interest you to know that I was at Dodger Stadium the day Rick Monday saved the flag was sitting in the left field pavilion. Luckily, I brought my transistor radio with me. That's the only way I could make sense of what was happening. Vin was whispering in my ear. It surely won't come as a surprise to you that when I think of that day, or Fernando's no-hitter, or Aaron circling the bases, or Gibson limping around them, it's Vin's voice that I hear. Come to think of it, he's narrated some of the sweetest baseball memories I own and I'm sure the same can be said for you. He began whispering in my ear when I was just eight years old. And by the time I was in sixth grade, I was hooked on baseball. So one day, I took Vin to school with me. I brought my transistor radio and I tucked it in my uniform pocket. I took the earphone, threaded it through my shirt, and hid the earpiece behind my mane of hair so I could listen to a baseball game during English class. <laughs> I thought nobody knew what I was doing. It wasn't until a classmate passed me a note demanding an update on the score that I realized the good was up. Now that I'm a teacher myself, I have a pretty good idea that Sister Mary Gabriel knew what I was doing that day, and she didn't bother me. She's the first person who ever encouraged me to become a writer. Instead of confiscating my transistor, Sister Mary, my transistor radio, uh, Sister Mary Gabriel gently asked me that day what kind of writer I wanted to be. I told her I wanted to be a baseball writer. It was the first time I'd even said it aloud. She laughed at me, so did my mother, so did my high school teachers, so did everybody I encountered. But what I love most about Vin is that he never laughed. He was my constant companion as I listened to those games on the radio in the backyard of my parents' house at 16816 Minnehaha Street in Granada Hills. <laughs> uh, you know, without knowing it, Vin was my constant companion and he taught me so much. He was the best tutor of all. I'd be listening to the games and I'd learn about baseball and I'd learn that stats aren't the most important thing. Vin was there weaving together a story using metaphors and similes, alliterations and allusions 
that prompted this tomboy to seek out Dickens, Twain, and I even listened to Broadway tunes. One day I grabbed a, a copy of Catcher in the Rye. Imagine my surprise when I found out it wasn't about baseball. <laughs> Anyway, I honestly don't think I ever would have be, I would have ever had the dream of becoming a baseball writer if not for Vin. That's the role he's played in my life. When I was eight years old, I fell in love with the game he so sweetly described. And some 16 years later, when I had reason to question whether or not there really was a place for me in baseball, Vin again whispered in my ear, this time emphatically telling me that yes, I belong, and that I owed it myself, to myself and to everyone else to live my life in the most authentic way. At the time I was working for the Daily News of Los Angeles, I was one of three women assigned to cover Major League Baseball. At the All-Star break of the 1984 season, I became the only woman assigned to the National League. Now that's an important distinction, because back then, all the club, each team got to decide whether the clubhouses were open or closed. In the American League, all the clubhouses were open, which worked fine for the three women who were covering the American League. In the National League, I quickly discovered that all the doors were open except those that were slammed in my face. One day in Cincinnati, I decided enough was enough. I'd read a little bit about municipal law, and I knew that Riverfront Stadium, home of my beloved Reds, was a municipal stadium paid for with taxpayers' money. So I decided I was going to march into the clubhouse, even though I had been told I could not do that. I blitzed past the guard at the door, mumbling something about my, uh, my press pass saying, admit bearer, not admit bearer with penis. And I, I really did that. <laughs> I'm a little bit peppermint patty, I have to tell you. Uh, and so I was uh, interviewing Mario Soto when someone, a clubhouse attendant, approached me and told me I had to leave. I wasn't finished with my pregame interview, so I just kept talking, and Mario kept looking at me, wondering what in the heck was happening. Uh, finally, when I wouldn't leave, I was picked up and carried out. If there were anyone in the press box who didn't know what had happened, they quickly became aware of it as uh, we neared the first pitch. Uh, the Reds' public relations director came down to the first row of the press uh, box where all the visiting writers were seated, myself included. He stood over me, screamed at me, called me a troublemaker, and assigned an intern to follow me wherever I went for the rest of the series. That poor kid, I took him on a tour of Riverfront Stadium. And I even invited him to follow me. He followed me to the restroom, and I invited him in. He declined the offer, but I told him, who knows? You, you've never been into this sacred space. Who knows what you're missing? <laughs> I tried to have a sense of humor because it was all I had. Um, truth be told, I was extremely frustrated, and I was humiliated. But I put on my game face, and I still made deadline. That night, I filed more than 100 inches of copy. I had to write a game story, notes, and a feature, which is a heavy load for a writer to pull out of their, their pocket. The next day, I called my editor, and I elicited his help. He told me, you're a big girl, handle it. I was 24 years old. I didn't have any mentors, and now I knew that my own boss wouldn't go to bat for me. Absorbing blow after blow, I began feeling pretty much like a human punching bag. Even though the hotel where the Dodgers uh, party was staying was just a few blocks from old Riverfront Stadium, I decided to take the team bus that day because the load I was carrying seemed a little heavier than usual. And frankly, uh, we're friends, I can tell you. I was really afraid that the security guards at Riverfront wouldn't let me in at, because of what I'd done the previous night, so I needed the muscle of the entire Dodger party behind me just to get into the ballpark. I was sitting on the bus and I felt somewhat invisible until our dear, dear friend Vin came by and asked if he might pull up a chair. Now who's going to refuse an offer like that? Vin said that he had one two-part question for me. He wanted to know if I could be anyone in the world, who would I want to be and why? Well, at that moment, I really didn't, I really just wanted to be one of the guys, someone who could walk into the clubhouse without causing a stir, someone who could cover baseball, that game we all love. So I told Vin that I wanted to be like Gordy Varell, a respected reporter who seemed to make everybody smile wherever he went. 
then the master of silence remained silent for a few seconds before saying, Lisa, I'm so sorry to hear that. Then went on to explain that try as I might, I would never be as good at being Gordy as Gordy is. He said that I owed it to myself to live my life in an authentic way. And he even posed a question, what if you could be better than Gordy? Honestly, that's a thought that had never crossed my mind because all my energy was consumed, just proving that I was equal to and that I belonged. I'd never thought I might be better than someone else. While encouraging me to be the best version of myself every day, Vin said something I'll never forget. Said that what I was doing was very important and that it was remarkable. <laughs> yeah, he used that word, remarkable. I embraced the advice that he gave me and I kept moving forward. And my coworkers and uh, colleagues will attest that most days there was a decided bounce in my step, a lilt in my voice, and a huge smile on my face. I was living the dream. Thank you, Vince Scully. Over the years, we've seen each other from, uh, outside of the ballpark from time to time. More often than not, it's at church. He used to sit on the, right, uh, the left-hand side of the church, and I sat on the right-hand side. Well, one day he came and tapped me on the shoulder and said, Lisa, why don't you join me? And I told, I told him, then I'm respecting your right to privacy, your time to pray. He told me that he thought he could pray better if I were seated beside him. <laughs> Off to his sweet spot in the church we went. Let's say I was never so popular during the sign of peace. People came from two, three rows away to shake my hand. And I think they said a word or two to that dapper redhead sitting to my right. Vince Scully's always been there for me. Uh, and you know what? We spent so much time in church together. Whenever uh, we were at the same mass, we'd sit together. And during the homily one day, the priest announced to the entire congregation that he wanted to go to the Dodgers home opener. He tagged the, sa the statement by saying, I know one of our parishioners can make that happen. <laughs> Everyone looked at Vin, who turned to me, whispered in my ear, Lisa, I think he's talking to you. <laughs> you think? <laughs> Vin, I'll get the angels right on that. Um, as you can see, the time I've spent with Vin Scully is sacred, and uh, I wouldn't trade a minute of it. Last April, I went out to Dodger Stadium on a Saturday, five hours before a game, so that I could steal a few minutes with Vin. I, I went into his booth. Once again, I blew past a guard who said, ask me, do you have an appointment? Of course I do, of course I do, Vin's waiting for me. So I went into the booth and Vin saw me and I was with Claire Smith, the other uh, living uh, female, the other woman who covered baseball in the 80s who's still alive. Allison Gordon passed away a year and a half ago. And Claire and I went in together and Vin greeted us like we were baseball royalty, saying how happy he was to see us. We spent about a half hour together and he told so many stories about his first, uh, his first broadcast and he uh, talked about a game involving Don Newcomb and how wonderful it was that he and Newcomb were still alive and they found themselves on the field again on opening day that year. But as we were parting ways, Vin took my hand and he said, Lisa, God has been very good to me. Me too, Vin, me too. I don't know what he's doing today, but I think it's a pretty safe bet that at some point, Vin will drop to his knees and thank God for his many blessings, this wonderful award included. I'm also confident that every single person here today has an endearing, if not enduring, story or two or 300 about our dear friend. That's the kind of man Vin Scully is. You see, the good Lord gave him a beautiful voice, and Vin chose to use that gift to entertain us, to inform us, to console us, and to teach us what kindness, goodness, and humility look like, and what they sound like. He embodies empathy, which is why I wish his voice were resonating today. The man is, in a word, remarkable. Thank you, Vin Scully. And on behalf of everyone here today, here's wishing you a pleasant good afternoon. And now in honor of Hilda, I'm going to ask that we all shout out together I, on the count of three, I love you, Vin Scully, and we're gonna ring these bells. You ready? One, two, three. I love you, Vin Scully. Thank you.
you, everybody. You've been just so kind. Have a great day. Vin Scully sent the baseball reliquary an email last week thanking the membership for electing him to the Shrine of the Eternals, and he asked that I share the following comment today. Quote, it is heartwarming to know there are people who care about the game and spend their time keeping it alive and vibrant. I am humbled that they would include me in this year's Shrine of the Eternals celebration since I spoke of my love for the fans in the days leading up to my retirement. Even today, they are the wind beneath my wings, end quote. That will conclude the formal part of today's festivities. Please enjoy the complimentary re refreshments available in the back of the auditorium and the good fellowship that is an integral part of the Shrine of the Eternals Induction Day. Last but not least, if you are not already a member of the Baseball Reliquary, please consider purchasing a membership today in the back of the auditorium. The basic annual membership is a modest $25 a year and will include full voting privileges for next year's Shrine of the Eternals election. Please join us, join with us as this organization continues to make a unique contribution to the cultural and baseball landscape of the United States. And until next year's 20th anniversary ceremony, we bid you a fond farewell.